at King's Manor, noisy motorbikes going past. And so we're here at what's known as the King's Manor. It is now part of the University of York and as history, archaeology, uh, English literature and various other uh, departments are here. Um, but it's had a kind of very extensive and interesting past really. It's had a lot of kind of different uh, purposes over time. Originally this was the home of the abbots of St Mary's. So if you've been on one of my tours in the museum gardens, we've seen the ruins of St Mary's Abbey. Well this is where the abbot lived. Pretty high on the hog it has to be said. He lived the good life. Um, it became the home of the Council of the North. It's quite a big deal really. Um, so the centre of royal justice for Northern England was based here. Um, they were start the Council of the North by Richard III actually, um, but when he died, taken over by Henry Tudor, he appointed his son Arthur to look after it. It wasn't actually here at this stage, it was at Sheriff Front Castle. Um, but then unfortunately Arthur died young and it kind of fizzled out. So Henry VIII then reconstituted the Council of the North and based it here. So this then was the home of the President of the Council of the North, so the kind of top royal official. And it became as well the kind of de facto royal residence. So hence its name, the King's Manor. It had been a property of St Mary's Abbey, but of course on the close down of the monasteries, all that property came across to the Crown. So the King's Manor, Henry VIII stayed here um, on, the, on the procession, stayed here with Catherine Howard on his honeymoon, um, but also but King Charles I stayed here in 1633 and 1639, and that's the crest that you're looking at up here. So this fabulous, fabulous, fabulous crest, which is all kind of restored uh, about 10 years ago, I think, of 800 year anniversary of York's Charter, um, portrays basically um, what is still at this time is pre-United Kingdom. So what we've got is we've got Charles is the king of simultaneously of England, see on the left with the cross St George and of course the rampant lion, but also on the right hand side we've got the unicorn and the saltier, the cross of Scotland. It also references in the middle with the harp, I'll try and get a little bit of zoom, um, holdings in Ireland and up and around you'll see Fleur de Lis which is also talking about holdings in France. So he really was a kind of man of many uh, manners as you might say Charles I, but uh, unfortunately he was also a bit of a spendthrift and probably not the brightest king we ever had, who got himself embroiled, of course, in the English Civil War, um, which was, in essence, really, a war that's about kind of modern democracy, really. Should there be limitations on the power of a monarch? Can a king do what they like? Are they only accountable to God? Or actually the people that pay their taxes? It's kind of really kind of rather different kind of question. So the English Civil War becomes, if you like, a dispute about the limitations. What can a king do? And where does he need to consult with Parliament? So his view was he was accountable to God only, he wasn't taking any truck with whatever Parliament said, but he kept running out of cash. And so he kept to keep going back to Parliament, bringing them together, putting up taxes to raise cash for his extravagant lifestyle. But of course it came with strings attached. And when Parliament finally refused to support him anymore, he prorogued the Parliament, got rid of Parliament, and he was effectively a dictator, an autocratic monarch for 11 years, 1629, 1640. But eventually he ran out of cash again. He had to bring Parliament back. And uh, unfortunately for the King, he was met with a nasty surprise. He was presented with over 200 charges of tyranny. In effect, he was put on trial, but he refused to be accountable to Parliament. And so, of course, we have there the roots of the English Civil War. So James I also stayed here, his son, so obviously you, you probably know. Bit of a plot spoiler if you don't know, English Civil War ends with a, a defeat for the Royalists. The York had been under siege in 1644 and eventually in effect starved. Uh, they, they kind of weigh in. So York fell, it had been the, the Royalist centre. So King's Manor, where we are now, had been the Royalist command centre in the north under Prince Rupert, the nephew of King Charles I. But of course he was defeated and eventually tried and executed. The only monarch that's been legally executed in England. And funny enough, I meant to mention yesterday where we were in uh, Richmond, a chap called Thomas Chaloner was one of the regicides, and these are one of the number of small group of men that signed the death warrant of King Charles I. I meant to mention him yesterday, but so I mentioned him today. A bit of a bonus content there for those that, uh, that saw it yesterday. So, um, James I came here when, when the news came through that Queen Elizabeth I had died in 1603. King James, actually King of Scotland, um, and consequently 
um, he was the, the all the effort that Henry VIII had gone to 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 make sure he had a son. You remember all that? Going to execute Anne Boleyn so he could going to marry again. All that sort of stuff. You will remember all those stories, right? He did have a son, but he kind of died young, and he thought she had no grandchildren. Henry VIII put you know four children on the throne. Was it three? Edward, Mary, Elizabeth. Three children on the throne, but no grandchildren between them. So consequently, it moved to his sister, Margaret Tudor, um, mother of Mary, Queen of Scots, who of course was mother of the King of Scotland. So it's what ties on with, with Paul, Paul Stewart's tours, right? Um, same history. Um, and so consequently, um, they uh, you know, went to him. And so the King of Scotland now becomes the King of England. And so in 1603, he stays here for three nights on his way down to Scotland to be crowned. At that time, the Lord of the President of the North was Lord Burley. If you remember when we went to Stamford Burley House, beautiful stately home, that's his ancestral pad. Um, so it all ties together. If you stick around long enough on my tours, all the history, all the bits will kind of stick together. One hopes to give you a kind of broad overview. So that's King's Manor. Um, we're coming to Exhibition Square, um, which is a sort of fairly recent addition, really. Um, sort of created to celebrate the great exhibition, the Victorian exhibition. And so we have the Art Gallery, which looks like a terribly old building, but it's actually it's a fairly new sort of contemporary building. It's in mid-Victorian, very beautiful. Um, and it is full of paintings, or it used to be, not, not so many now, by a chap called Walter William Etty, rather, who is behind me on this statue. And he's a kind of name that's kind of rather fallen out of day-to-day -day parlance. He's a royal academian and um, rather fond of painting nudes. So did people collect them because they love of the human form or was it really the playboy of its day? You know, not, it's not for me to cast aspersions, but uh, he did seem obsessed with painting bodily bits and pieces, you might say. So William Etty um, plays a really crucial role in York and a reason why I can quite confidently say that York is England's most beautiful city is our walls. People are just dumbfounded by the beauty. We're going to have a look, I think we we'll have a little walk on the walls actually um, today. And uh, he plays a key role because in the middle of the 19th century, the, about 1820 around then, there was a view by the county it was time to take down the walls. They were in a poor state of affairs, they'd been badly damaged during the siege of York 200 years earlier. They'd not been maintained. And it's the era of the industrial revolution, trying to get raw materials in, finished goods out. And these narrow medieval gateways don't really lend themselves to you know, that form of kind of transport of goods. So like a lot of towns and cities at that time, the idea was to pull them down. But this is where William Etty came in and his great friend, Sir Walter Scott, okay? The author of Waverley novels, you know, uh, what's, what's the, the, up in Edinburgh, the Scott Memorial and so forth. Um, it's a great med medievalist, romantics if you like. And so basically, um, they decide to start a campaign. William Etty and Walter Scott is believed they're the first sponsored walk in history that took them from Edinburgh down to London, raising funds and raising awareness, make York a special case. The King agreed. I mean, obviously, technically, he was mad. It was King George III. But nonetheless, it was agreed that York not only should keep its walls, but also enhance and preserve them. And so when we look at the gateway coming to Booth and Bar here, we're looking at the site of the Roman gateway. Above it, we've got a Norman arch. We've got an 11th century arch, sort of the, right in the kind of centre at the bottom. And then we've got a structure that is it, sort of built in the 13th and the 14th century, at various times strengthened to withstand attacks from the Scots. Of course, the Great Wars of Independence had seen uh, attacks on York and uh, <clears throat> You know, the, the Parliament of, under Edward I, the Edward II as well, been brought up to York at various times to kind of help deal with the threat from the Scots. But still, nonetheless, what you're looking at is a Victorian reconstruction. Um, and so there are certain bits on the walls. I think we're going to go for a walk on the walls. I wasn't planning to, but I've just decided it's so nice that we're going to go for a walk on the walls. Um, so, um, basically, they were sort of taken apart, sort of brick by brick. And, uh, and what we can see um, includes here and there some Victorian additions. So the statues up on the top, Victorian additions. There are some very pretty turrets, not so much on this section, but further around on the walls. Um, they're added in really basically as sort of, sort of follies really, not a bad description, 
because this is kind of very much at the time that people were kind of obsessed with medieval England. The stories of Robin Hood and Maid Marian, okay? Um, all that kind of romantic stuff. Um, King Arthur, Guinevere, Sir Lancelot, that bizarre little menage. That's what I'm just holding forth because we may get a little glimpse of the minter there. Can you see that? A little cheeky glimpse of the minter's ankle there poking through. And uh, Etty Avenue, absolutely. Etty Avenue uh, down in, in Tang Hall in York. Absolutely, you're 100% right there. So the signal may drop here un momento, so do bear with. I'll be out the other side. We're inside now the gateway. And if you're able to see, the signal hasn't dropped. These windows here precisely aligned to the Great North Road. This is the route where the Scottish attacks will be likely to come and strike. So this Booth and Bar is basically an armoured gateway. You know, it's got a muscular, bulky feel. When we look at some of the other gateways in York, they are kind of light and sinewy in their quality. They're so beautiful um, and probably romantic. Whereas Booth and Bar, like a bulldog, it stands there with its shoulders, like ready for that. Okay, bring it on. Bring it on, Scotland. We're ready for you. Okay, so... Um, much of this side of the city uh, was obviously exposed to, um, to battles. It's obviously the Siege of York in 1644, our first glimpse of the Mint. I thought it was such a nice day. We'll get some nice shots of the, um, of the Minster. And of course, the good thing about going up on the walls is we get to look at the Minster in the eye, as you might say. From a ground level, it simply overwhelms us, right? We are kind of, we can't compete. It's meant to make us feel small. That's the kind of whole point of these cathedrals. It's kind of God's majesty on earth, right? And we want to be able to really look it in the eye. Um, so on the ground level, we just stand there and we marvel. But up on the walls, we start to get more of a sense of the Minster in terms of its size, its scope. Um, and it allows us, um, I think to really see quite how it dominates the city, how we just look at the rooftops, um, and that's, that's a four-story building in front of us there, the red brick, um, and the Mississippi Towers above everything. It's completely out of scale. It's like a monopoly, you know, you get a little house with the big hotels, it's like that. It's just kind of completely dwarfs and dominates everything else on the kind of skyline. So as a result, it kind of gives us a really interesting feel. Like I can't think of many other cities where you could visit where just nothing because there's, there's no skyscrapers here there's nothing on anything like the scale and obviously there's ordnance that, that would protect um development on that kind of scale but but nonetheless it just feels almost like comically bigger than everything else that uh, you know if you, if you look at the picture of, of york from the sky um that's a great way to look at aerial photographs whether it's kind of drone stuff or typical sort of air, air, aero photography it's a great way of looking at it because you can see firstly the cruciform shape so in other words it's a cross shape like all the cathedrals of its day or most of the cathedrals it was built like a cruciform pattern so pointing towards the east you've got a big east window you've got a big west window so the west window is where we're looking here so that's the western towers the towers at the west end of the minster and and then you've got transepts sticking out either side so shorter or stubby bits, as you might say, that are the arms of the cross. Now, it's slightly spoiled, so if you do have a look at it, I would put a picture of that, but I didn't know it was coming on the wall, so I just came for, I'm, just, I'm just going with my urges today. I'm unrestrained. I'm going with temptation. I'm giving you in to temptation and doing what the hell I like. So hopefully that's okay. Um, but we'll be back on the, on the deck shortly. It's only a short bit of the walls, this, but it's such a pretty bit. Um, so they, they, they form the cross shape, but then it's slightly spot. Look at these down here. Are they bluebells or hyacinths? Botanists amongst you will, uh, will no doubt be able to tell me that. Like bluebells, I think. Um, Durham's, of course, of course Durham is lovely. Um, but Durham, Durham's kind of like two cities um, in one, insofar as that you've got like, a bit like Lincoln. Lincoln's another example of this, where you've got a lower city and then an upper city, and there's nothing, nothing really joins them as such. So York is different insofar as it's a continuum because you've got one set of walls that, that kind of wraps around. So yeah, the, the, there are many very reasonable comparisons that can be made with, 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 with Canterbury, with, uh, with, with uh, Durham, with Lincoln, some of these you know, historic cities of England, but none have quite got, I think, the same kind of configuration that York has got, or have been so successful at keeping out kind of rogue buildings that would otherwise kind of dissipate and kind of break up the, um, the overall impact. And this is what's truly special about Lund uh, York, and, and for those that haven't visited, um, 
or have just got a flavour on these tours. There's kind of two things that I think make it a really, really strong contender. I mean, I think it is England's most beautiful city. I would say that. But the reason that I think you can say that with confidence is two things. It's firstly the sheer number of attractions, whether it be the walls, obviously the cathedral, the churches, the streets, the buildings, the sheer number of them is, is astounding. But the second is the proximity. There's almost no bits in between. And whereas you go to most cities, there's a great district, then you've got to jump a, a tube or you know, a bus or taxi or whatever, you've got the next bit. You haven't got that in York. It is so small and so compact that it enables us to walk around. And of course, walking is far and away the way to experience the city. I can't think of a single better way to experience the city than on foot. So consequently, York gives us, and, and that also as well, within reason, it's very accessible. So okay, coming on the walls, maybe that's not so much. But for the most part, York's very flat. You know, we sit right at the bottom of a valley. And so consequently, for people that aren't necessarily as mobile as they once were, you know, it is, it's very, very doable, is York. So, um, you know, that, that's, that's kind of one of the nicest. Now, if we can see from up here, we went on a snooky tour the other, week, the other week, and uh, I couldn't bring you up here, it was a bit too far. But we weren't able to see, because there's one outside St. John's Co uh, University, not St. John's College, it's a big college, now university. Um, and it's very funky, it's a Dracula one, actually. Um, so it's a shame, it's such a good one, I can't I think why I didn't put it in the city centre. But uh, there we go. Um, so we'll just come, this is called Robin Hood Tower, where we're coming, which is rather busy around here, so I'm just sort of getting us through and past. But we may well be able to see when we kind of go over the ramparts here. So obviously it's really a gun tower originally. Oh, and it's just behind that tree. Unfortunately, we can't see it. So again, Lee's of course is commercial, but uh, I don't think it would claim to be anything other than, now we're not gonna see it. Unfortunately, it's right around the tree. But this is St. John's University. So York's got two universities. The, uh, the University York University, University of York up at Heslington. And, and then the uh, St. John's University right here in the heart of the city overlooking the city walls. So wonderful place to study. My nephew's here right now, doing product design. And uh, of course, it is fabulous views looking out across the moat of York on the walls. And it's just such a lovely place to be. And again, we're starting to get now in this presentation, we've got the Minster fully side on. Now I mentioned that there was, there was like a little fly in the ointment as regards to the sort of cruciform pattern, it's sort of symmetry. And that's because of the chapter house. So if you look at a picture from, from the sky of um, the Minster, you'll sort of see it's a perfect form of a cross, but there's this little round building stuck out in one of the corners. And that is the chapter house. And it's a building here, it looks like it's got a witch's hat for uh, a roof. You just see it probably poking above the trees right there. And so that is almost a separate building um, with a corridor built onto it that connects it to the Minster. It was the first bit that was completed. It was finished in 1290. So building work started in 1220. And it's important to note there was a Minster here before. There was a perfectly good kind of Romanesque um, church, a cathedral, that had been kind of founded um, and, and built in kind of William the Conqueror's time. Um, so you see 11th century. Um, but I suppose, you know, like a lot of things, it, it, it had been outpaced. There was definitely an arms race when it came to kind of cathedral building, the magnificence, the grandeur, the size and the scale of these things, that, that by the early part of the 13th century, there was a sense that York's Cathedral was being left behind. And also people were looking enviously at these new Gothic styles, both the perpendicular about building with great heights, but also this Gothic architecture was working its way into the style. And so, under Archbishop de Grey in 1220, the kind of plans go down to build this enormous edifice. And there's something to me about the sheer ambition of this building. I'll come back to it one sec. This, by the way, these are follies. So I was talking earlier about Victorian follies on the walls. This is not medieval. This is just, I love Robin Hood and uh, I want to play bows and arrows on the walls. So uh, I'm going to create those. And uh, you put it into lots of guinevere's, lots of floaty wimples and so forth and a heaving bosoms and chests up and down here playing, because of course, down here, as we once was mentioned, was private gardens. It's only fairly recently, I don't know what the building here, by the way, um, it's only fairly recently that, um, that this has become a walkway. It's not until the kind of later Victorian period. So the very wealthy of York would have had these, if you like, as their playground. Um, so it may well be that it was sort of some Victorian sort of romantic fantasy, and who knows what they got up to in those cozy little towers. Perhaps it's best not to ask that question on a family show like this. Um, 
but there was a lot of that. You know, they kind of loved, and it's a kind of rejection, of course, of the modern world, the dark static mills. So instead, they're kind of retreating back to this romantic pastoral version of England. This kind of idea of an, an England before it was spoilt by those rotten industrialists that were belching you know, black smoke and coal into the sky. Those ones are cleaner, purer. They kind of ignore the black death in all this, complete lack of sanitation, um, and the fact that people on average live to about 35. But if you put that to one side um, and you focus more on you know, wimples and floaty dresses, then it's very easy to kind of romanticise the medieval period. Um, but that's what they did. There was all that. So um, these are private gardens. And I say, and this must be part of the Minster developments because this is the Dean's house. Quite a modern bit of the development here. And they're doing quite a lot of work in this area, so I'm assuming that is part and parcel. That Tish wants a floaty wimple. I mean, who wouldn't, um, being honest? And you can, you know, you can go, go around fainting, can't you? And giving your uh, little hanky to your champions and, and seeing what they'll do. For your un unrequited love was the thing in those days, wasn't it? You know, you weren't actually allowed to get it on with the person that you fancied. You had to uh, kind of just be in love with them from afar because they were sworn to another. Um, so there's an awful lot of these heaving chests and passions unrestrained. Not unrestrained, what's that word? Uh, unrequited, perhaps? I don't know, anyway. So, of course, this is one of the most famous views of York. You'll see this on many photographs, calendars, and so forth. The fabulous grazing. A tell is, uh, is down here. Uh, as the gates open, I hope they don't mind, we'll just take a little step closer. So this is kind of one of the views that I think is so often used to represent uh, York. And I think it's because it really captures York in all its kind of um, higgledy-piggledy majesty insofar as that it's a bunch of buildings that architecturally are unrelated. So actually, the, the building kind of front and centre, the real Grey's Court Hotel, which recently won the best hotel in England a couple of years back, I think, um, that's quite a modern elevation. Sort of maybe early Victorian, perhaps late Georgian around then. Um, but the building itself is the oldest inhabited building um, in York, dating back to kind of 1066, that kind of period. And behind it, you've got the Treasurer's House, that was largely rebuilt in the sort of 16th century. And then, of course, the Minster, built between sort of 1220 and 1475. So... There's no architectural master plan here. This is not Paris. This is not a space that has been uh, created or curated. But nonetheless, the incredible uh, way it glues together, I think, is, is quite astonishing. And, and we're just left almost breathless with the beauty of it. And, and for those that are coming to York, do take the opportunity to visit. You can see the, the tables and chairs down there in the gardens. You can spend time here at Grace Court and really kind of soak up the atmosphere, but as I say, the combination, Treasurer's House, Grace Court, the Minster, and of course the ancillary buildings around, does create a fantastic vista. But I say it's by chance, it is, it's not being designed. So I think it, it, it's organic. Uh, look, a castle, I agree, it does it very much like a, like a castle uh, charity. Um, and I think it's fantastic that, you know, when things can hang together, because so often, you know, we look at nature, um, like we're, yes, in Swaledale, and you look at the beauty of nature and then of the, the bloody mess that we kind of make of it. But just sometimes man gets it right, or humanity gets it right, should we say. And we manage to create things of astonishing beauty, where there appears to be a harmony here between the buildings, the gardens and the sky, are kind of coming together um, of a, just a, a deeply satisfactory outcome um, that just stays with you. And it's one of these things that just pulls people towards your... Um, and it's easy accessible. Like, as you saw, we, we got on the walls there, we come up and suddenly, as I say, we can see the minster for what it is, this truly enormous cathedral. Um, we're going to go down in a minute, and we'll, we'll be down at ground level, go a bit around the minster again. And you kind of see how the dynamic changes completely um, because we are at a kind of different trajectory. So it's always worth, if you can, those are able to, uh, with mobility, get up on the walls and have a look because it just gives you that different way of understanding and seeing the Minster and how it kind of really just, it is fantastic, isn't it, this guy? Um, it really kind of comes together um, as this fabulous building. So just to mention while we are walking along, if you're those are familiar with it, we are on the walls, we're on the, sort of the northern section from Bootham Bar to Monk Bar, so Monk Bar is in front of us here. And this is, um, as you can see down here, this is here, the... Uh, the gateway to the Roman fortress. And what I was telling us is that this line of walls that we've been walking on for the last sort of 10 minutes or 15 minutes or so um, follows precisely the line of the Roman walls, the Roman foundation. So consequently, this top end of the city is defined for us 
by the Romans. The Romans who haven't been here in York for I don't know, about 1600 years, they're about slightly over, but are still defining how we experience York in terms of its gateways, its bridges, river crossing, street layouts. Incredible, you know, they were here for 400 years, so it wasn't like, a, you know, a here today, gone tomorrow. But nonetheless, York has stubbornly resisted the temptation to shake off. So whilst we look around and it is the medieval buildings and the Georgian buildings in particular that define the York experience keeps people coming back over and over again, whether it be on these tours or in person. Actually, it's the Romans that have created the blueprint, the shape, the structure, the flow, the feel of the city that we are all kind of confronted with every time we are walking in York. So we're coming to Monk Bar, um, coming to view. It's the second of our gate, which is going to come down. The signal may well drop. Um, the Richard III Museum is absolutely, so Richard III very closely associated with York. Uh, as I mentioned, he um, was a sort of patron of the city. Uh, he also invested his son as Prince of Wales at York Minster in 1483. And uh, he funded the restoration of this here at Monk Bar at York. So uh, his museum, which sets out the case for his innocence. So the single may drop here, don't worry about it. Um, unfortunately, that's just the way it is with the internet. But I'll just come out here, so I'm not anyway. Um, we can't really do much about that, so the signal will probably drop for a second, but we're going through a really kind of brilliantly kind of claustrophobic uh, staircase that, that really kind of brings home the kind of nature of the walls for us. But I'll just give you a shot of the interior, so we get the inside of Monk Bar. No chimneys like that in America, well that's why you come here on these tours, right? To uh, Europe, has got a very just different architectural story, isn't it, as you might say? and different ideas of architecture. Um, so I think I'll just give you a perspective of, a, of the front elevation of Monk Bar. So unusual amongst the four bars, this is the only one that doesn't have a gate. So we've got, uh, you know, uh, it's not a booth of us either. So ignore me, I'm talking rubbish. Um, but it's far and away my favorite. He was innocent, says Susan. There are some of the things that, if you haven't already, do uh, dig out my Midland tour. We talk about uh, Richard III, the case for and against on that tour, so hopefully Susan will check that out. If, if you haven't, you're interested in Richard III, find out my, uh, my tour on my YouTube channel. So now's a good time to say, if you aren't already, please give me a follow, subscribe, like these videos. If you're in a position to do so, of course, leave me uh, a, a contribution towards my running cost, that'd be great. But if you can't do those, you can definitely give it a like. So if, you can't, if you're not in a position to, to, to support one way, let's try and do it another. So everybody is, is helping this advance because the more likes you get, the more comments you get, the more YouTube goes, that must be a good video, I'll show it to some new people. And of course that helps us to grow and sustain. So even something that just takes you a microsecond could make all the difference. So thank you for your cooperation. So let's go and look from the Minster. Shall we go down this way or shall we go down that way? I think, do you know, today we will uh, we'll go down this way. So we're going to Goodrum Gate. So Goodrum, now to Guthrum, Gate, Garter, Nordic Road meaning street. So this is Guth the street of Guthrum. Guthrum was an important Viking king of the 9th century. This building's of course a good deal later, which is 16th and 17th century, but uh, it still carries the name of our Viking king Guthrum. And so we're now going to be entering into the Minster precinct. We've walked around the edge. So the outer perimeter of the precinct would have been the walls where we've walked now, but then internally within the city at ground layer, there would be a big wall surrounding the, city, the, the Minster. So in effect, it was a city within a city, and there was gateways that controlled access. Of course, the Minster was full of uh, absolute <laughs> treasures, ecclesiastical gold, silver, artworks, and so forth. Um, so you controlled access. So this is the remaining gateway, the one that's still here, from the medieval period on College Green. And uh, so as we pass under the gateway, you're imagining there have been centuries, heavy gates here controlling the access. We're passing into the Mince Precinct area and we're immediately computed with, uh, presented rather, with firstly, a couple of very, very funky tea shops, the National Trust gift shop, very nice as well. But if you're in York, always trying to support the independents. And these are lovely. In the daytime, tables and chairs are outside, both Crumbs and the Vanilla Cafe. And it's beautiful. And you sit out here uh, under the shadow of the Mince by St. Williams College. And uh, it's magical. Couldn't, you know, pick a better place. So uh, if you come into York, 
These are two cafes that I would strongly encourage you to uh, patronise. Look at those, are lovely. Little balloons in the window. They make such an effort to make it so pretty and so lovely. And Julie's right. If you're just charity shops, there's quite a few in the street behind us. So if you like a good dig through looking for a bargain or a buried treasure, then that's a great space to be in. St William's College now is on our kind of right-hand side. It's a Chantry College. So Chantry for the Chantry Priest, the Latin cantare to sing. And the Chantry Priests had a very specific role uh, in, in Christian uh, life, and that was sing Masses for the dead. We're talking about a time of the kind of high Catholic faith. Um, excuse me, take a support. When everybody bought into the notion that um, the blossoms are lovely, um, the purpose of this life was all about attaining salvation in the next. But even after you died, you still had a chance to make your way to heaven. Because most people that died wouldn't actually go to heaven or hell. You have to be pretty bad to go to hell, but it'd be extremely good to get to heaven. Most instead would go to a place called purgatory, a kind of infernal waiting room where the torments were there but not as bad as hell. So it's a bit like being in a, you know, waiting for a plane that never arrives. You've got toothache and there's kind of music on in the background, okay? And a crying baby next to you. That is that sort of torment, really, um, rather than the kind of being pricked and burned, you know, in hell. But it's pretty, it wasn't nice, purgatory. But what could happen was that, that people could pray on your behalf to kind of expedite your passage through um, purgatory and have you on your way to heaven in no time. So these are called intercessions, interceding on the behalf of the deceased souls. And so the church made a great deal of cash out of this by charging people for prayer. And so the priests that lived here were um, chantry priests. They sang masses for the dead in the Minster. And it wasn't uncommon when people died of great means to leave the money behind for 30, 40, even 50,000 people. Masses, sorry, to be said. Um, to kind of to, to get them through to heaven. Because of course, we all remember the verse in the Bible, right? How's it going? It's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than it is for the rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. So consequently, the rich are the They're told, stump up. And of course, the money they pay in, well, that's what pays for this. This is how you get there. So for dawn, a dripping tap, or a ticking clock is purgatory. For, I said, I think, well, I add in, you know, kind of some sort of white noise and some toothache and a baby crying as well. I think yeah, that, that, that sort of gets you to how it was meant to be. It weren't meant to be nice. Um, it's very annoying, niggling, you know, kind of grind you down um, sort of purgatory. We say that it's like being in purgatory, you know, without really remembering kind of where it comes from. So it's this state in between. And of course, then Judgment Day, you remember St. Michael weighing your soul against your sins, all that sort of stuff, right? Um, and the Great East window that's in front of us, um, is definitely a presentation of that. The bottom two thirds of this, in this largest medieval stained glass window in the world, is a presentation of the revelations of St. John. So St. John, um, who starts off as an apostle, goes to Patmos and something like that, and then sets out his kind of revelation of you know, the end of the world, basically. And I've actually got a fantastic book uh, about this that I may well do a tour from home with some photography of the, the, the place, because obviously you can't get near it. You can't get inside it and never get permission to do that. So it may be that actually doing something um, with the kind of the colour plates um, of this window may be worthwhile because it is absolutely sort of stupendous. I say it's, it's the largest expanse of medieval stained glass anywhere in York. Uh, this, this, this cathedral has got about 40% of all of England's medieval stained glass in total is here. 40%. So just kind of <laughs> bear that in mind. You know, we are rather spoilt for choice. And again, this blue sky really rewarding us today. So let's... Uh, Let's just enjoy the kind of movement. There's something wonderful about video that you can't really get on um, walking tours. We should get to frame it. Um, I was a frustrated photographer. And so I always enjoy the physical framing of these shots. Um, so we're passing by then the, the Minster Stoneyard. And whilst they've been doing, obviously, work on the stone in, in York for centuries, um, somebody about 10 years ago had a brilliant idea of why don't we put it out in public? And then what can happen? So I think this, you know, I was saying about earlier what's being built. I suspect it's this thing here we're looking at that's, uh, that was being built when we saw from the walls. Um, that if we put this, this work out in public, then people can not only see what we do, the craft and the technique, but also can be more inclined to support it. And so, as you can see, uh, this young lady is doing here, 
they're working in public. So if you come down here during the day, you see the benches over there, the stone that is kind of midway um, through kind of being crafted. Um, so consequently, you know, what we've got is the, um, the restoration and the maintenance, the protection of the Minster being done using extraordinarily uh, sort of classical ways in terms of the way that all this stone down here is carved, it's all done by hand, sort of hammer and chisel, but in a very kind of savvy contemporary way that's around kind of fundraising and raising awareness of kind of what it takes. So as you can see, all this, this stone here has been cut to replace stone that is up on the elevation here on the south side of the bin. So this, this is the south transept sort of sticking out. So uh, that was all about the little stubby bits like the arms of the cross. This is one of me looking at here. This, of course, is where the fire was. The roof burnt in 1984. Um, so that's, God, that's going to be 40 years this year, isn't it? Um, and here is uh, one of the gargoyles that's going to go up. So it's, a, it's just a brilliant idea. And of course, as a result of that, a lot of people then will, will kind of fundraise, will press the button and, uh, and chuck a few quid in, which is fantastic. It's, that's, that's kind of what's needed. You know, we shouldn't be shy in recognising that uh, there's huge amounts of money that is required to um, be able to, uh, you know, run these things. And uh, so I'm just going to come over here and show you the refectory, because this is a part of the, the Minster that is, uh, it's, you know, it's, 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 it's part of the new, I suppose, sort of um, income generating tool. It was formerly the Minster School. Um, until that closed during COVID. But it is now kind of opened up as a kind of fine dining restaurant. And I think it's a beautiful place. So again, if you're coming here to York, then why not take the opportunity to come and find out, and in doing so, knowing that you're supporting the Minster. And you'll see, as we kind of come in close, I don't want to come in and film too closely, because obviously people are having their dinners. That's right, so Dawn remembers the fire back in 1984, during the mystery place in June of 1984. Or July, June or July, anyway, one of the two. And uh, it at the time, people believed there was controversial statements made by the Bishop of Durham that called into question the uh, Immaculate Conception, which was the idea of Mary getting pregnant without uh, uh, a man involved, as you might say. Um, he made comments about this, saying we shouldn't take it too literally. And some people believed um, that as a result of this, God struck down York Minster. Now, quite why he wouldn't strike down Durham. Uh, cathedral. I'm not entirely sure. Um, but there we go. Um, it was apparently, certain people believed it, but uh, in actual fact, obviously it was hit by lightning. Uh, oh, that's the reality of it. Whether, whether, whether that, was, that lightning was by chance or by, by purpose, by holy intervention, I guess we'll never know. It was a lightning strike. And what they were doing at the time, there was a, you know, they call the sonic luminaire things, you know, the, the kind of light at night. So because of the mystery plays were on, the, 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 the religious plays, there was a show that was happening just below here. There was a big lighting rig up there. So on that roof that you can just see sticking out, that was kind of covered with, you know, a lot of techie stuff and everything. So you know, electric cables and stuff. And so when the lightning struck, bang, you know, that's what uh, exacerbated and, and sort of sped up the fire. So this is the south side, the famous rose window in the midst of Central Tower, kind of rising up above us. I've got a Western Tower here, just on the kind of edge of the picture. So you can sort of see now as we're kind of coming along that kind of difference in the way we're experiencing it. Now we're sort of looking up and having to, to crane our necks taking the Minster rather than being able to look kind of straight the way across it. Um, it is an absolute treasure. Um, and in case you're sort of wondering about the scaffolding, this is routine maintenance. Nothing bad has happened here other than it's just been here for a long, long time. So you're placing stone that might have been originally put in place, you know, six, seven, eight hundred years ago. So consequently, it is going to erode. It's exposed 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Um, and so, you know, we've got a constant challenge of the upkeep of the Minster. Um, so it's very hard to look at it and actually know which bit is original and which bit has been replaced at what stage, because they constantly use the same stone. It's the white magnesium limestone that is going to be in use. We're going to have a look at the doorway, I think. I think I've shown you the South Transit door for ever, I don't think. Um, so consequently, as we get kind of closer at what you'll see is bits that have got a different shade. Um, and this is basically the restoration work. It's an ongoing project. And I think there's now like a hundred year cycle where basically, you know, over time, um, you know, about a hundred years, they will kind of work away. So you can see here, you come in and see this paler stone. So you can see there quite clearly that uh, would seem so. Susan mentioned about uh, Notre Dame fire. And after the North Jam fire, um, a team from York went across to help them to evaluate because obviously they had a recent experience here of dealing with the kind of fire. So, uh, 
you can see they're kind of replacement stone. But also, if you come just down here, we can see the sort of problems associated with, uh, with kind of damage. So you can see how this is sort of breakaway, this, this sort of stone. I can probably get a better picture, but I can't get into that area. Um, beautiful lantern, isn't that gorgeous? Um, it's a beautiful old oak doorway. You used to tell oak because it gets darker and darker over the years, the, the tannins in the oak. So if you think, oh, wasn't it been dark in those days? Well, yes, it's true, but actually it's a sign of really old oak. So wonderful old door handle here, Isn't that fantastic. I want to bang it, but I don't want some angry policeman opening the door. Uh, but look at this, isn't it beautiful? Little Tudor roses carved in. So this is the door, the south transept of York Minster. Fabulous bit of English oak. And uh, we're talking about Durham earlier. We, it, so typically these, these were carved out of gigantic um, trees, uh, these doorways, but now the giant oaks have all gone. Henry VIII used them for warships like Mary Rose. And so the English oaks were largely kind of wiped out, unfortunately. So they're no longer around, but um, there's lots of them to be found in our cathedrals and church buildings. So I'm just thinking where we're going to go next. What, what about for time? I have no idea what time it is, but he's just come on here and start talking. And there's all over it, 27. So should we go? I think we'll go. Well, we have to go show you the shambles, won't we? We couldn't do York without the shambles. But uh, let, let's just do it in our, we'll have a little bit of Stone Gate first, I think, uh, and take a barley hole and we'll go that way around, shall we? So we'll give you the, 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 the treaty spoily way of going. So the, this is the second of the precinct gateways. This is called Minster Gates or Bookbinders Alley, as it's once called. I love that name, Bookbinders Alley. I love it, antiquarian bookshop here. Um, so this was like publishers and printers. This, this area was very much associated with printing and, and book publishing. Um, so we get a lovely view here, where it kind of cuts in, you see the great rose window, the, ro the rose window which commemorates the, uh, the union of, uh, of King Henry VII with Elizabeth of York, the daughter of Edward IV. Um, so this you can see, imagine here the other gateways. So just this, this, if you like, starting to give us a sense of how the Minster is kind of closed off to, to co commoners access. You need a reason to go in there. And probably coin too. Uh, you know, let's not beat, beat around the bush. You know, fundraising and the church were, were always, you know, kind of very happy bedfellows. In fact, round here, you'd have found lots and lots of works for sale, particularly on woodcut printing, souvenirs, okay? So pilgrimage, people would come to the pilgrimage of St. William of York would then, you know, buy a souvenir. The, the originals of Paul Stewart set off as in a pilgrimage walk and, and the, the shell there is the symbol of El Camino. Well, each of these pilgrim routes had their own symbols and uh, you'd, you'd have them hammered into your walking staff. So if any of you, I don't know if that, if that's a, that happens in America or, or Canada, um, but over here, very older people you get walkers and they'll have little metal badges like pinned onto their uh, walking sticks so you can see where they've been. Well, that starts with the pilgrims. That's a pilgrimage thing. So walking along, so if you saw a pilgrim with an with, with a, with a oyster shell or clam shell, is it? I forget which, whatever it is, the, the, the El Camino one. Then of course, what that meant was they'd done El Camino. They'd been to Santiago, um, so St. James of Compostela. Um, and, and so the, the, each of these routes had different symbols. So modern tourism really comes from pilgrimage. That, that's where it starts off because obviously along the route, you have places to stay, places to eat, sometimes places to get better, you know, if you, if you were ill. So tourism really starts. We think about you know, holidays, what's a holiday? It's a holy day. You know, everything culturally in our history is redefined by um, the sort of, you know, our, our kind of Christian medieval experience. That's kind of shaped, you know, the way we think about things and so much the kind of human geography. So, um, so yes, so people would kind of buy souvenirs. So again, there's, there's nothing new and modern thing of coming and, and, and buying rubbish while you're here. You know, the church started that. Um, and they loved it all. So coming into, um, down uh, the, the kind of longest snickle way in York, and uh, a little sneaky peek at Barley Hall, which of course one of my favourites, you all know how much I love Barley Hall, and it is so clamshell, thank you friend. Um, such a lovely spot, and so peaceful, let me just be quiet for a second. You see? I don't know if you heard a couple of minutes ago, I was getting quite frustrated because there was some drunks behind me shouting, I was trying to ignore them, but he just threw you off after a while, but suddenly, quiet. Faint church bells in the background. They're beautiful. So this is um, a wonderfully kind of restored medieval townhouse in York, almost destroyed when they kind of peeled back when they were doing some demolition work in the 1980s. 
Um, they kind of took it apart layer by layer and then realised there was a substantial house behind here. A chap called William Schnorchel lived here. It's kind of high point. Um, it is stunning. And so the developers realised it was more than they could handle passage of the York Agricultural Trust. And they not only kind of renovated, but also turned it into a really, really cool um, visitor attraction in York. So an historic attraction here in York. So you can come, and for a very modest fee, I think about six pounds, something like that, six pounds maybe. He's come and visit. And uh, it's probably a bit dark to see inside. You can see inside there. The signal drops, I beg your pardon. But uh, you can see there the reconstruction of a medieval banqueting hall. Thank you, Elizabeth. That is most kind. Bought yours inside the cathedral. Um, yeah, is it, what's being filmed? The Patience, is it? I don't, I don't know what. Is, 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 that, is that a film of a book? I don't know what Patience is. Excuse my ignorance uh, in that regard. Um, I, I knew I'd seen the, the pictures, but unless you subscribe to the local newspaper, you can't actually open them. So I don't really know why they bother putting stuff on Facebook because you can't bloody see what it is. But um, so do let me know what, what, what is Patience? I know the, the city centre is going to be closed down for much of uh, the next week, which is fine. I, I tend to work on weekends doing this, so it won't really affect me greatly. But uh, it would have annoyed the hell out of me in the walking tours day. Funny if I remember <laughs> where we were a few minutes ago, I showed you that doorway on the Minster. One day, or oh, before COVID, I was walking down here, around here, and uh, suddenly we hit like a barrier. And I was really annoyed because it was like right in the middle of my route. I was thinking, like, we couldn't go any further. Uh, and it was a wedding. Uh, which I didn't realise. Oh, I sort of half knew about it. It was on my kind of radar, but I kind of forgotten. And she called Ellie Goulding, pop singer, and uh, and so, I can't remember his name, but he's sort of blue blood, sort of North Yorkshire old money, you know, type. Because you have to be to get married in the Minster, you need to have like roots into like you know all that real old money stuff, you know, that um, different kind of world to, to where I'm from, right? Um, and so we just rocked up there, just at the time that suddenly all these limos start pulling up, so we're going to get held up. And the kind of police was like, no, you're going to have to stop there. So we stopped by this gate and then suddenly these limos come up. And uh, first of all, it's, um, I can't remember, what, one of Sarah Ferguson's daughters, Eugenie or Princess Beatrice or, or one of them. I can't remember which one. Uh, and then as you, uh, Jimmy Carr, the comedian, he came. And then Orlando Bloom and Katy Perry, they came. And then suddenly there's a whole bunch of people, like, you know, some of which well-known, some of which obviously just high sight people had no idea. But they all just like kind of disembarked. Uh, I kind of went into the Minster uh, and then five, five minutes later they kind of opened up and we went on our way. So these people, of course, it's fantastic that uh, they're still seeing Hollywood A-listers and so forth on this tour around York and we're uh, most kind of congratulate to me and I kind of took the credit shamelessly and sort of pretended it was all planned. But of course it was pure bunkum and actually at the time I was rather annoyed. So uh, Ellie Goulding, my sister outside to the wedding. Oh, there you go, Julie. So Julie knows all about this, what I'm talking about. And it was quite the collection of A-listers that day. She's obviously very well connected. So uh, I, I was happily took the credit for that uh, and all the tips that went with it. Um, but of course, it was pure serendipity. So we are on the bottom of Petergate now. If we'd continue sort of back in this direction up here, you see the Minster in the background, that would be in Bootham Bar. So this is the via the Principia, the main Roman gateway running through the city of York. So as I told you, the kind of Romans define the shape and sort of structure of the city. So that kind of takes us all the way back down now, if we continue on here, pretty much down to Warmgate on the southeastern side. Casper Jopling, is that the, are they split already? Well, there you go. I have to think the more they get spent on weddings, the, the shorter the marriages last. You know, cheap and cheerful. Make it about being married rather than getting married. And uh, you've probably got a better chance of staying together. But uh, I'm pretty wrong. I'm sure there's some great examples of people who've had very extravagant weddings. And, uh, and I've stayed the course, but it just seems to me that there's an inverse ratio. The more you spend, the more it seems to be about the day itself, rather than the strength of the union. But there we go. What do I know? So we were down here was it three weeks ago now, four weeks ago. We went to the Snooks. We talked about books and publishing. And it's an interesting tour that I enjoyed that. So again, if you haven't seen that, do check out on my channel, on my YouTube channel, uh, Exploring Yorks with John. Um, the Snook, a bookish adventure, I think I believe I called it. Uh, I enjoyed that tour. It's a good one. Um, so let me just take a sip of water before we descend into a shambles. These tours so often turn into a shambles, but uh, with very good reason, I think, given that we are about to enter York's famous shambles. So Tish of the Snooks, so there we go. Um, so near Prince Andrew two or three, I've met Prince Andrew actually, before he was disgraced. Um, I got a, I've got a Prince Andrew's community medal for the work that I did in cricket. So uh, I've met him. Nice enough guy, but uh, of course, 
his behavior which called into question subsequently. So it looks like we've largely got the shambles all to us. I thought should I say shambles? It's almost impossible not to say the in front of it, but we look at the street sign and it is shambles. It's not the shambles, it's shambles. Um, and just try and say shambles though without saying the shambles. Like for some reason you can't say, I'm going to shambles. Just doesn't sound right, does it? I'm, I'm, I'm staying in a house on shambles. Just, just, it just needs that definite article. Never was a the more well-placed than the one that is missing in front of the shambles. So anyway, let us, uh, let us three not, or come back on. And uh, so shambles, what do we need to say that I haven't sort of said lots of times before? You know, is of course, in, uh, one of England and Europe's most famous sort of preserved kind of medieval streets. It's quite a mishmash. Some of the buildings are kind of more modern, but I think it's, it's this middle section that kind of really captures our imagination and where so many people will spend time trying to perfect and craft that perfect shot for, for, for the socials, because there's something about this configuration of buildings here that enchants it. Like something out of a fairy tale. It is like an illustration from a book that we read as kids. This idea of old kind of merry England is no better represented, I think, anywhere in the country than these few buildings uh, here. It just gives us a kind of astonishing uh, kind of representation of how we used to live. This kind of glimpse of a world before the Industrial Revolution. Um, and it, it, people don't tire of it. They are utterly enchanted by this. And the closer that we kind of get in and we start to kind of pan up, of course, the famous York ghost merchants here with great queues every day for people to come and buy these little critters in here. Um, so they've got a perfect location here. But the more we kind of walk into, the more suddenly we become part of it. I think this is a really important part of the shambles because it feels like it folds in on you. Your vista, as you can see, begins to diminish almost entirely. There's no vanishing point because you can't see anything. It folds in on you. It makes you part of the experience. They talk about being experienced as being incredibly important these days. Certain things you can't get online, although hopefully we can get it to a degree with camera work on here. But that once we're in the centre of the shambles, we're quite literally inside it. We are within it. It envelops us. It's got a womb-like quality that allows us to kind of just delight in... It's really hard to describe, Joe. Obviously, you can see for yourself. But just... It's, like it's, so, it's exhilarating. That's what I'm going to use. And that's why people come back over and over, whether that's in person or coming to watch it on video because there's nowhere else quite like it. With this crazy closeness at the top. So it's entirely possible to shake hands across the streets. So quite how, there's, there doesn't mean fires here to destroy these buildings is absolutely miraculous. But nonetheless, we have them. And of course, if you look at old pictures, if you go on, on Google and you have a look at uh, you know, the shambles you know, in the Victorian era, it was very tatty, it was falling apart. Make no mistake, this has been restored. It doesn't say that it's all by itself. It takes time. Potions Cauldron. If Linda's on here, I think she was there earlier. Got your retirement present from there, Linda. Um, on the shambles. Uh, but isn't it something? Dawn was amazed first time she saw it. Yeah, and it just stays with you. It just stays with you. See, if you want the right view to, to kind of sketch, I think there's interesting. It depends how what you like on perspective because technically it'd be kind of quite difficult, but I kind of like dropping a little and getting these kind of images. Um, Catherine, you know, where you really start to get into the, the shape and the unusual lines of these buildings. And as I say, this sense of almost a canopy. And actually in its heyday, there would have been canopies because these were all butchers uh, shops. They were, so, you know, as I've shown you this before, you know, there's various hooks that on these, above these shops that show they're past, uh, you know, rolled as kind of butchers for hanging up kind of meat carcasses. On this one, slightly more modern, we've got Victorian kind of meat hooks up here. So you see up here for the suspending of meat on there. Um, and some of the oldest ones over here, the kind of the medieval meat hooks, you know, stuck into, you see there? So there have been canopies across. This was a street of butchers. It was a meat market, like Smithfield Market in London. And so consequently, um, not a nice place to be. The place that we're now absolutely drawn to, you know, would have repelled us in years gone by. It was a nasty, smelly, dirty place of animal slaughter. Um, you had blood and viscera 
in the streets of the open sewer in front of us here. So not a nice place to be. It's fair to say it's cleaned up his act somewhat, has the shambles. It has definitely uh, given us something that is, let's go down here. It's one of the, the alleys running off the shambles, lots of these alleys connecting. And this was where the livestock market was located. And there was, there was a green day in the background here. Yeah. Um, time my life, isn't it, that one? Um, so the livestock market would be here. This is where the animals in pens. And because, of course, there's no refrigeration, no freezers, the animals were killed, sla you know, were slaughtered, obviously, and then butchered and sold very kind of nearby. It's a very small sort of physical ecosystem of meat production in this area. Um, the most in-demand meat from the very wealthy was actually offal. So, you know, kind of liver and all these kind of things. Because you could eat it very fresh, didn't need to be hung, you know, or tenderised. And, of course, it was very easy to chew. A lot of people had bad teeth. So, consequently, you know, these very delicate, soft meats, they were what people preferred. So, actually, you know, the, the tough, tough rangy meat, the slow cooked stuff that we've now kind of come to, to get really excited about in our culture, a lot of it's very kind of low cost meat, is it? Originally, now very expensive to buy, but originally, not really wanted. Those sort of deep, muscly meats, um, they take long, long, slow cooking. That's what the poor people would have eaten. So, uh, so we kind of come to the bottom of the shambles here. We're, uh, we're coming towards the end of the tour. I'm just going to we'll finish up at the castle today. Because uh, my car's near there, so we'll, we'll take you down there. Um, seeing Thomas Herbert's house. Uh, we walked there on the Snickerways tour. Yes, we did. And Catherine was with me on the Snickerways tour. So that was fantastic. Um, we got you hung in the gallery. We? we exhibited you in the gallery that day in York, Catherine. Um, so Thomas Herbert's house. So I mentioned earlier about uh, Chaloner. That was one of the signatories of uh, when the, uh, Charles I's execution. Well, here is another. So, so this is the, um, the house of Thomas Herbert, who was the chief manservant of King Charles I, who attended to him during his confinement. So when he was locked up, um, Herbert stayed with him and he attended his execution with him. So I think as we're here, we might as well go down to Lady Peckett's yard and take in another of the, the beautiful buildings of York. So let's say, this is why you can confidently say, it's the most beautiful city, not just because we've got the best buildings off there, I think we have, but because as you can see, you, there's no distance. L look at what we've seen, look at the quality of what I've been able to show you in what I've been on, maybe an hour, maybe a shade under an hour, I don't know. Um, it just keeps on going bang, 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 bang. You know, it is, um, you know, the, the, the concentration of these incredible buildings and structures and architecture is, it just takes your breath away. You know, it's, uh, this is why, it's a great place to come either on um, in person, but actually I think it's a pretty place to come on virtual tours because a lot of places, and I try not to pick these places, but I've got what they call spaces in between. Uh, I, I remember talking to Aaron and Patrick about this one time. Like, yeah, we love doing these routes, but what do you do when you have to walk 10 blocks and there's nothing to talk about? And of course they, they horse around and, and, and have fun, right? Um, but that's the challenge is, is what do you do? How do you kind of keep an audience interested when there's not a right lot to walk to look at? Well, in York, you just haven't got that problem. Because even like this street is probably the least attractive bit in York, kind of warehousey. Um, but you know, then we're out to Fosgate, and it's quite charming all over again. So you, you know, it is an absolute gift for a video tour guide because in an hour, hour ten, whatever, however long this this is going to end up being, there is such a kind of myriad of um, sites that we can kind of show you just to kind of take in. That um, I think it's, it's just a brilliant. It's an absolute gift. And I try and give you, of course, you know, different things, tell you the different stories or mix up. We haven't actually done this particular walk for, for months, it's probably the best part of six months since we last did this one. Um, so I don't like doing the same thing and repeat myself over and over. But of course, there'll be people that haven't been on them before, so uh, it's nice to give you the opportunities. So we're at the crest of the Merchant uh, Taylors, Merchant Ventures rather, here at York. So again, the historic crest, but we're going to walk our way across the foss. And uh, we're going to walk across to the castle, and I think we'll take a wrap from there. So did, did anybody tell them, by the way, is, is anybody on one of these tours for the first time today? Um, do let me know if you join. I used to ask, and that sort of got out of the habit, really. Um, because if you are on the first, there's a fabulous community that isn't just necessarily about watching uh, the videos, as lovely as they are. You can get involved through our Facebook group, um, together virtually. Um, so if anybody is new, do you put your hand up, give us a wave, and uh, I guarantee within five minutes you'll have a dozen new friends that will, uh, will, will help to orientate you in this world of ours, which is uh, a lovely, kind corner 
of the internet where people are nice. Catherine against Tyler York. Why would we? I, I, is it London, Dr. Johnson, if you'd, you'd be tired of London, you'd be tired of life? Well, I think if you chop out London, which is quite easy to get tired of when you live there, um, and put in York, I'd, I'd be more entitled to, to, to what well, I'm to agree with you. But uh, there we go, horses for courses. And maybe Dr. Johnson wasn't familiar with York, we'll let him off. So Red Lion, that contains this pub here, one of the sort of longest running sort of constant um, operating pubs in the city. It parts of the 13th, 14th century, a fireplace um, in the front room. And best community family ever, absolutely running. What more could we want than not only to visit great locations around the world, but go there with our mates? So uh, they're in. So nobody's telling me they're new, so, although you're shy. But don't worry, if you are shy, you can still, uh, still go and look out together virtually, discover the world on Facebook, join the group, and of course look at the website. And, uh, and subscribe to the newsletter and do the things uh, that will help you to stay on board. So we're on the River Foss uh, right now, walking our way around to the castle. So the castle built by William the Conqueror, at the kind of the junction of the two rivers of York, the Foss and the Ouse, excuse me. And uh, it's funny, you know, we kind of talk about, the Norman talk about an awful lot about yesterday. So many of my talks about Norman Conquest, because really it's basically what shapes Yorkshire so much. And people often sort of say, well, you know, how do you start getting interested in history? And uh, don't you put an advert pop up? I'm sorry, that, that, that's, that's the flip side of me being monetized. Um, I didn't press the button for that, they just chose to put it on. Um, but hopefully you wouldn't miss anything. Um, so consequently, uh, I remember getting a picture, a, a poster on all kings and queens of England, and it starts with William the First, 1066. Um, and 1066 for English people is such a kind of iconic date that we were kind of encouraged to think that history started then. And of course, it's absolute bunkum. There was, you know, thousands of years of history before 1066. But of course, not history written by the victors. So, you know, the predecessors, of course, before we had the... Uh, the Normans here were the Vikings. And this area we are here was an area that was extensively settled by the Vikings. On the name of Jorvik, the Vikings came and took the city by force in the year of 866 to avenge the fact. So those that watch the Vikings TV show will be delighted to name the three sons of Ragnar Lothbrok, Ubba, Halfdan, and Ivor the Boneless came and took York by force in 866, or rather they meant to. But actually, the York people were elsewhere. There was a civil war going on in the kingdom of Northumbria under King Ayala. And so consequently, it was a bit of a stroll. They just wandered in and kind of took the city. But kind of a better late than never, the Northumbrians turned up the following year, 867. And we then had the Battle of York, the Battle for York, if you like, where the Vikings basically mullered the, the Northumbrians. And uh, it then becomes this Viking capital, which uninterrupted then until 954. And then again from 1016 all the way through to 1066, this is a Viking stronghold. And it's the reason why William builds two castles here. One in front of us, one on the other side of the river. There's only the place in England that had two castles was London. Because York was a prize asset. So not only was York, I still believe, England was a beautiful city, it was also one of England's most important cities because its location, its proximity, roughly halfway between England and Scotland, between London and Edinburgh, you've got York, but also only 40 miles inland from the um, Humber Estuary, and 40 miles to the sea, and 300 miles across it, you've got Denmark. So it made it incredibly easy for the, the Vikings to send reinforcements. And so every time they thought we've taken York and held it, they were in for a nasty surprise. And so the castle that we're looking at right now actually dates from the early parts of the 14th century. It's not the castle that William built, that was built of wood. Although the mound that you're looking at most definitely is. Now it's told that they built this in six days. Now I find it very, very difficult to believe that this was actually built in six days. But it does suggest that it was built rapidly because it was all about shutting out those pesky Vikings, okay? So the whole thing was about taking York and controlling it and then closing off access to the city by closing 
the gates to the river. Great chains run through the river to prevent the longships coming in. It's looking beautiful. And again, we've got these lovely flowers. I think we'll, I think we'll finish off up at the top. And, and so the response of the Normans was twofold. They've got two castles here to control the land. And then they set about destroying it. What's could be known as the harrowing of the north was a systematic destruction of York, the surrounding area, and so much of North Yorkshire to prevent this land going back to the conquest of the Vikings. Because what the Normans knew, what they recognised, was that whilst we might associate the Vikings with coming to conquer, to rape, to pillage, to steal, in actual fact, they came to farm. They came because the land on offer in Scandinavia wasn't great. The days were short, the winters were long. And on this mild, cool, wet island, the opportunity for farming and settlement, for raising families, was second to none. So half of England on the eastern side was settled by the Vikings. The Dane law, as it was called, and the Dane law was agreed with Guthrum, the king that I was telling you about on Gudrum Gate, who signed a deal with Alfred the Great, making England, or half of England, under Viking Danish control. So when we say the history started in 1066, it is rather rich. But it's true that history changed completely in that year. Because not only was it when finally the Vikings were smashed, but also when York, the kingdom of Northumbria, becomes, for the first time in its history, part of this idea called England. So whilst England is celebrated, York amongst it is its fine, most famous, beautiful city, it's the latest entrance. York is a relative newcomer. So it's a bit cheeky of us to steal the title of this beautiful city, but I do hope that you'll agree that after an hour or so walking around look our claim is pretty strong and we will uh, we'll take on any challenges that want to claim that other cities have got that we what we've got um, but uh, of course they're proud of their cities too so thank you everybody so much for joining me and um, do as i say subscribe like give me a follow um it's very noisy down there some music what's going on um and, um, and and get involved get involved in the facebook group um, and do funky things, write comments on the videos and uh, all that sort of stuff that uh, it is it's fabulous having you all on board. I don't know where I'm going to be next weekend, I haven't decided yet, but uh, we'll do something fun together. So until next weekend, thank you everybody for your ongoing support, for your buying coffees and PayPal's, all those wonderful things. Absolutely epic, it really helps uh, and allows me to know that I can just set off in the car and go to places and know they'll cover my petrol money and, and, and coffee and keep me out sure. So that's great. Thank you so much, everybody that does that. Um, so in the meantime, from the top of York Castle, I'll give you one last look across the city. I say, I think there's like a folk music or something going on down below us by the river. So uh, we'll go and find out what that is. But uh, for now, I'm going to leave you in York and I'm going to leave you in suspense because uh, that's your lot. My battery is very low. So thank you, everybody from York. Thank you, Elizabeth. It's been an absolute pleasure once again. And see you all very, very soon. Bye-bye.